good evening everyone and welcome to this webinar on formula for success of cpap in three terms i'm sumana shri from gha and i'll be your host for this evening i would like to start by thanking everyone for joining us today we have a great turnout of participants and I'm so excited to have you all here this webinar is part of gha's ongoing commitment and initiative to providing high quality education and training to healthcare professionals we believe that it's important to stay up to date on the latest research and best practices and we are excited to share that information with you this evening cme webinars and workshops provide a collaborative platform for participants to network and learn from each other while also providing the opportunity for professional growth in this webinar we'll be discussing on neonatal ventilation course we have dr abhishek s aradhya as moderator for today's webinar we welcome you sir we will have a presentation from our speakers dr shrinivas murki and ks gautam and dr ks gautam after the presentation we will have a question and answer session where you can ask any questions you may have i hope you all make the best use of this exclusive webinar and that you find it informative again thank you for joining us today before we proceed i would like to give you all a brief introduction about global healthcare academy global healthcare academy is india's leading med edtech academy at dha our paramount mission is to nurture a pool of competent and compassionate human resources catering to the ever evolving needs of the healthcare sector we firmly believe that technology is the key to unlocking the potential of learning and it plays a vital role in each step of ed our educational journey our core purpose lies in bridging the crucial skill and knowledge gap that often exists between traditional education and the dynamic requirements of the healthcare industry to achieve this dha offers a diverse array of five academic verticals allied healthcare continuing medical education global dental academy global healthcare publishing and gha conferences now i would introduce dr abhishek s aradhya the moderator for today's session dr abhishek s aradhya is a pediatrician and neonatologist practicing at ovum women and child specialty hospital hoskote bangalore he did his mbbs from Bangalore Medical College with a gold medal in preventive and social medicine. After graduating, he moved to Chandigarh for post graduation in MD Pediatrics from India's premier medical institute PGI. He worked as a senior resident in the same institute for one year. He also finished super specialization in neonatal intensive care at PGI in 2017. In the last five years, he has been associated with Obum Hospital. currently he is the neonatal director of all nicus of obum hospitals we welcome you doctor i would now request dr abhishek to take it forward so thank you sumana for that uh, kind introduction so can i have the slides of gautam sir as well introduction slides of gautam sir sure doctor so i welcome all of you for this uh, interactive session on journey of neonatal ventilation so all of us would agree with me whenever we hear the word icu we always think of gadgets especially the ventilators and ventilators are life saving devices but we have moved away from invasive ventilation to gentle ventilation and today we have with us i can say the legend in neonatal ventilation dr k s gautam sir so gautam sir as we all know is a chair of pediatrics and pediatrician in chief at nemus children's hospital orlando florida he is also the research director of nemus children's hospital he underwent super specialization training at pgmr chandigarh so it's almost i can say almost 30 years back three decades back after his fellowship in neonatology at the university of vermont he served as a faculty member there and was a postgraduate fellow at the vermont oxford network he also served as tenured professor of pediatrics at baylor college of medicine 
He's also deputy editor of the Joint Commission Journal on Quality and Safety and a senior editor for the neonatal review group of the Cochrane Collaboration and editor in charge of diagnostic test accuracy reviews. He is an editor of well-known textbook, what we call the Bible of ventilation in newborns, that is assisted ventilation of newborn, the Goldsmith textbook. He is also the editor of neonatology section and Rudolph textbook of pediatrics. He is on the editorial board of the Journal of Perinatology. We welcome you, sir, for this event. Thank you, Abhishek and uh, Sumana and Vignesh. Thank you for inviting me. Are we ready to start? We are ready, sir. So we are going to take you through a case scenario which we commonly would encounter in our practice. Note down any questions or controversies you face or what we answer. We'll be ha happy to take up your queries in between. If you can raise your hands, we can take two questions per scenario. So, Gautam, sir, shall we start? Yeah, I just want to explain to the participants today that this is going to be an interactive discussion, not a lecture. So we would really like the audience to participate and engage with us. You can chat in questions or raise your hand. And at each scenario, we want to pause and engage in a discussion. Uh, we really want this to be interactive. That's the main point. Okay, so let us start, Abhishek. We have 23 participants, and I'm sure more will join as we go forward. So in the Zoom, we have 23. I think in other platforms, we have many, sir. Oh, I see. Okay. How will the other platform people chat in questions? They, they can chat in the platform, sir, either through YouTube or the web platform. Okay, yeah. good. That's good. So you can type in the questions as you look at the scenario or what differently you would do, or any queries you have related to evidence or experience which you would want to ask from the sir. So in the next couple of minutes, we hope to cover these things, that is prematurity and bronchopulmonary dysplasia burden. Remember, as neonatologists, our life, our job is not just to save newborns, but also to prevent bronchopulmonary dysplasia in these tiny preterms. We are going to discuss about which ventilation modes during invasive ventilation. We are going to skip non-invasive ventilation because we have a separate lecture coming up next week. Ventilator settings optimization, VAB bundle, extubation, quality assurance and audits. With this, we'll begin with the case scenario. So 30 weaker, primary mother. The estimated fetal weight was 1 kg. The mother had a cervical stitch in situ for short cervical length. She developed preterm onset of labor. The obstetrician administered antenatal steroids just four hours prior to the parents meeting you. Magnesium sulfate for neuroprotection is also being given. Now the concerns of the obstetrician is when can she deliver? And what do you want to counsel the family? So I can tell you what uh, we would do here in the US and everything I say today is with that disclaimer that I have not practiced in India for over 25 years. And I really want to learn from the experts in India what, what their view is. In this situation, the obstetrician would call me as the neonatologist to come and talk to the family. And before I talk to the family, I would consult with the obstetrician and talk to them about what the plan is. Obviously, the obstetricians have to weigh the risks of premature delivery to the baby versus the risks of leaving the baby inside uh, and the risks that would in, uh, accrue to the mother because of that, especially if she has an infection that is causing the preterm labor or uh, some other cause. What I would like in this case is 
the delivery to be delayed as much as possible because every extra day every extra week the baby stays inside is beneficial for the baby's maturity and the baby's lungs so i would uh, talk to the obstetrician and request them to delay the delivery as much as possible barring that i would at least wait for 24 hours for the steroids to act and if they want to use tocolytics and other medications to slow down the preterm labor i would uh, strongly encourage that when i go in to counsel the family and that's a whole different talk about prenatal counseling i would ensure that uh, i have three goals for this one is to help them be prepared for the nicu experience so that it's not such a shock when the baby is admitted and they walk into the uh, nicu number two explain all the risks and uh, potential problems that the baby might develop in the us at 30 weeks in general we don't expect a lot of problems but in india the situation might be different especially if you're in a government hospital or in a primary healthcare setting or some other uh, setting where there are not a lot of resources and the third thing is uh, what, what we're doing implicitly in these prenatal counseling sessions is building a relationship with the family because for the family when they walk into the nicu for the first time and they see the entire room full of technology machines incubators strange people it's very comforting for the family to have a familiar face that they met before so i have found that the time in the mother's room before delivery where you go one on one and talk to the family it's almost a sacred time where you bond with the family and establish a relationship and that helps you explain decision making to the family later on and help helps you counsel them as they go through the ups and downs which are natural in the nicu anything you want to add abhishek from an indian context so uh, similar thing what we try one of the big challenge in india is the cost will be one of the major decision makers especially in the periphery where most of the patients would want to understand about the cost and second from the obstetric perspective they want to deliver immediately they generally do not wait so as you said most of us we wait for at least 24 hours after the last dose of steroids has been given which may not be possible in at least 50% cases either because of maternal sickness or because of request from the family per se absolutely thank you yeah the cost is an important variable in the indian setting that has to be discussed before birth and also if the mother has to be transferred for the delivery that also has to be discussed again thank you okay any questions from the audience please chat in okay okay keep going so unfortunately we could not wait because the baby had to be delivered by preterm vaginal delivery the steroid was could only be given or exposure could only be given for 4 hours the newborn had poor efforts despite delivery room cpap so the treating team intubates the newborn shifts the baby to nicu the admission temperature we end up with hypothermia that is 35.5 degree celsius in in the nicu the concerns from the treating team are so the baby is intubated now which ventilator mode should we choose is it assist control or simv or a hybrid mode that is simv with psv should we add volume guarantee should we start directly hfov since we have a ventilator with hfo <laughs> that's a very important question so i want you to notice that the admission temperature is a bit low so that has to be taken care of the point here is you have to focus on the global care not just on ventilation and i know that's obvious but i just want to emphasize it uh so which ventilator mode to use let me share a slide
can you see this we can see sir we can see right so if you look at the evidence for prevention of uh, bpd uh, these are the slides that illustrate the relative risk reduction and absolute risk reduction for interventions for which there is evidence supporting the reduction of bpd interventions tested in rcts so if you look at volume targeted versus pressure limited ventilation if you look at the combined outcome or death or cld the relative risk reduction is 27% and the absolute risk reduction is 12% and if you look at cld chronic lung disease alone in survivors again the relative risk reduction is 32% and absolute risk reduction is 11% so volume targeted ventilation has advantages over pressure limited ventilation uh the question about whether to use high frequency or conventional again there are benefits to reduction of bpd or bpd or, or death as a combined outcome if you use elective ventilation the trade off is there's a high there's slightly increased risk of air leaks from use of high frequency ventilation there was a large uh, randomized trial by philip cools and uh, colleagues this was also followed by a individual patient data meta analysis that was published by the cochran uh, review group a keith barrington is the author and you can look that up <clears throat> so i would definitely say uh, volume targeted ventilation versus uh, pressure ventilation volume targeted is the way to go but there is a bigger issue here uh the point i want to emphasize is that your unit has to become familiar with one or two modes of ventilation and become expert at it rather than switching the type of ventilation every time there's a new consultant or every time there's a new representative that brings a new machine consistency <clears throat> and uh, adhering to a simple repeat rep repetitive pattern of care is very very important with ventilation so all the people in the unit should get together develop a guideline where they look at the evidence look at the indian context and the press context where you are practicing come up with a guideline that will help you consistently deliver care one baby after the other instead of every baby being a simple case uh sorry a unique case i am reminded of a quotation from bruce lee bruce lee said i am not afraid of the man who has learned a thousand different kicks i am afraid of the man who has learned one kick and has practiced it a thousand times i'll repeat bruce lee said i am not afraid of the man who has learned a thousand different kicks i am afraid of the man who has learned one kick and practiced it a thousand times and to me that represents the importance of consistency and having a guideline that you apply baby after baby unless of course the baby has unique uh, circumstances so that is what i would recommend uh, based on this and of course not many units might have a high frequency oscillation so use what you have develop a unit guideline and use it consistently baby after baby that is my main message does everybody agree with it abhishek anything you want to add to that agreed with you sir fully because every new ventilator company comes in they bring in a new mode which works similarly but they confuse especially the nurses on ground because nurses <clears throat> get confused if you have different types of ventilator or even the fellows on ground so as sir said let's keep it simple most of them work similar so hfo i think not many of the units may have hfo so you can safely use a pressure control mode with a volume guarantee right i'm not seeing any chatted in questions there's a question about antenatal counseling what would be depth if risks that you would counsel family to balance anxiety yes uh, during the antenatal counseling one of your important goals is to manage the anxiety of the family and uh, decrease the shock 
because it's all uh, it's a very traumatic event for a woman to go into preterm labor and get admitted so you have to build a relationship decrease their anxiety and counsel them so that they are better prepared for the nicu experience okay shall we keep going right sir so the baby was at 30 minutes of life the baby was managed in the unit using pressure control with volume guarantee so the baby is requiring 50% oxygen on a map of 8 so the surfactant was administered at 30 minutes of life so post surfactant the baby is still intubated at 1 hour we are weaning off the oxygen the fao2 is reduced to 40% so common question is how do we optimize ventilator settings from here so that there is less lung injury should we use a continuous monitoring should we do blood gases how frequently it should be done to answer that question i want to start with uh, i want to share my screen i want to share a conceptual model yeah this one can you see the we can see slide sir. okay when you are ventilating a baby you have to be very clear that you are driving on a road and you have to stay in the lane and not going to one side or the other side of the lane on the one side of the lane you are trying to achieve adequate uh, you are trying to avoid excessive uh, lung inflation and gas exchange on the other side of the road you are trying to avoid lung collapse and lung injury so whenever you ventilate a baby you have to support lung inflation and gas exchange and avoid lung injury and if you do this successfully you will ensure that the baby survives that the lungs are not damaged when the baby uh, is extubated and also there are a lot of data coming out that ventilation and respiratory support affects brain health and we know that from prior experience with fluctuating blood volumes that lead to ivh as well and maybe pvl in preterm infants the problem with most of the monitoring systems we use oxygen saturation clinical examination blood gases x rays right they tell you how good a job you're doing with lung inflation and gas exchange there are no clear markers for lung injury so if you are causing a willy ventilator induced lung injury with the barotrauma volume trauma oxy trauma or atelic trauma there are no signals there are no tests that will tell you that you are causing lung injury so you have to be very very careful and have surrogate measures like the percentage of time that you have not exceeded the upper limit of the volume uh avoiding hand bagging and a lot of other things that cause uh, lung injury you have to consciously monitor but again i don't want to get into the specifics of how often should you uh, check blood gases of course all these babies should be uh, on a continuous monitoring system both uh, cardio respiratory cam crgs pulse oximetry and uh, i like to use transcutaneous uh, co2 monitors i think those are uh, very useful and there are some data to show that if you use the transcutaneous oxygen monitors the co2 monitors you will uh, do a, you will get better outcomes in babies so definitely use whatever equipment you have don't ignore clinical examination looking at the baby looking at how the baby's chest is moving how the baby is breathing in synchron in synchrony with the ventilator uh, examining the baby's endotracheal tube auscultation very very important so definitely use bedside monitoring electronic monitoring pulse oximetry if possible transcutaneous co2 don't ignore clinical examination use radiographs judiciously not automatically but remember that whenever you are doing all these monitoring you are not monitoring lung injury and that is going on in the background in a subtle hidden insidious way 
and that will come back to bite you later. So you have to monitor the uh, volumes delivered and ensure that you're not causing uh, uh, trauma to the lungs. I hope that answered the question. Anything you want to add, Abhishek or others? Uh, we, I agree with you, sir. So in summary, it is the clinical monitoring. Take help of pulse oximetry. I understand transcutaneous monitoring is not available in most of our units, except the institutes. And uh, X-ray, as I recollect, we need to do X-ray only if you're suspecting collapse or pneumothorax. Otherwise, routine check oh. X-ray should be avoided. And lastly, the blood gas. So we see many units doing blood gas. Like it's it's a common practice to do one hour after any ventilator setting change, but they keep doing religiously every six hours or 12 hours, which probably we need to have a pre-test probability before actually ordering a test, which applies even for a blood gas. Okay. Any comments from the... So we have a question from the previous scenario by Dr. Bikramjeet from Kolkata. Dr. Bikramjeet asked that you have HFO plus VG in the unit as well as assist control with volume assist control with volume guarantee. So given availability of both the equipments, which one should we choose as the first choice? Are those the only two choices? They are the only two choices, sir, in the question. Go back to the previous slide. Yeah, again, I don't know what ventilators you have and what exactly they are capable of delivering. So I hate to give you a recipe that might or might not work for your unit. But I would say, broadly speaking, ensuring that you deliver the required tidal volume using volume uh, technology. So you dial in the volume that you want, uh, which is a, a guesstimated tidal volume for the baby and ensure that there's pressure support for the breaths that are not supported by the ventilator. That would be the default way that we ventilate and it's the simplest way to do it. So this baby was how much? One kilo? One kilo, 30 weeks, sir. Okay, so let's say you want to give six ml per kilo you dial in the settings in your ventilator that will give 6 ml per breath for the vent breath, and you can pick a rate of uh, whatever, 30 or 40 based on the CO2. And of course, you turn it down as, as soon as possible, and then add pressure support on top of the peep. And that should work well in most situations. There's no need to go to fancy things like HFO with VG or other things. I don't, typically don't use assist control uh, where every breath is supported uh, in most babies. But again, I don't want to get into recipes. You have to understand your equipment. You have to understand your resources and infrastructure. What's going to happen at 2 a.m. in the night when no doctor is in the unit? You have to ventilate using that knowledge. Develop a unit guideline and again, ensure that people adhere to it religiously. That's my main message. Okay, let's keep going. So there's another question, sir, uh, related to antenatal steroids by our colleague from Dr. Supreet from Chandigarh. She asked, so there's a lot of confusion about dexamethasone and betamethasone. Although the government of India recommends dexamethasone. So what should be the choice you feel, sir? Uh, I would favor betamethasone. I don't know what the basis of recommending dexamethasone is. It's effective, but I think betamethasone has some advantages. I have to admit, I have not reviewed the latest literature comparing those two. If anybody else knows, please uh, contribute. So recently there was a steroid trial which compared dexamethasone versus betamethasone. They found that with respect to the efficacy on the newborn, both dexa and beta fared equally well. While in the long term, the beta methasone group had higher hypertension at two years to the tune of 40%. While in the dexamethasone group, it was lesser. It was around 28%. So considering that the safety profile dexa had an upper hand with respect to Indian 
perspective, we do not have beta methazone acetate in India, sir, which is a long acting salt. So with respect to availability, since we do not have a long acting salt and storage recommendations are more for beta methazone, the government of India recommended dexamethazone in, the, in its national guidelines. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. I wasn't aware of that. Okay, let's keep going. So moving further, now the baby has moved to day five. This baby required ibuprofen for hemodynamically significant PDA on day three. The baby is still intubated. We didn't get a chance to extubate. The baby is on map of eight centimeters, 40% oxygen requirement. The baby is on second line antibiotics because of sickness. The baby has reached 60 ml per kg of feeds through orogastric tube. The baby is on partial parental nutrition. A new nurse has joined the unit. Her queries are, what should be the frequency of suctioning? Can we prevent VAP in this newborn? So we're giving feeds, we're giving partial parental nutrition. What additional care or nursing care we need to take care to optimize developmental supportive care in this preterm. Excellent questions. Uh, definitely, we should be trying to uh, enhance developmentally supportive care. Uh, one second, I'm trying to pull up a slide here. <clears throat> so one of, one of the things that is really helpful for developmentally supportive care is uh, doing kangaroo mother care, even with the baby on the ventilator. So if you come to our unit, you'll see mothers sitting in chairs with the baby on the chest, still connected to the ventilator. So that is something that we should uh, definitely uh, uh, encourage. The other thing is uh, we there are organized programs like NIDCAP that have been associated with improved developmental outcomes. And uh, it's going to be hard to implement the entire uh, uh, NIDCAP program uh, for uh, for babies, but you can definitely implement uh, components of it, where you create nesting, you know, minimize handling of the baby, cluster care, uh, put boundaries around the baby, minimize uh, sensory stimuli, and so on. So definitely ensuring that developmentally supportive care is provided along with uh, ventilation is very, very important. Frequency of suctioning, I would say as, as infrequent as possible, because the more often you disconnect and you go in with the catheter, uh, the higher the risk of uh, infection and introducing things, especially if you introduce saline. And uh, prevention of VAP or ventilator associated conditions. So we used to call it ventilator associated pneumonia, but nowadays the CDC calls it ventilator associated conditions. And the subcategory of that is ventilator associated pneumonia. Uh, definitely, we should try to prevent it. And again, the methods to prevent VAP are good hand hygiene, prevention of infection in general. Avoiding unnecessary entries and disconnections into the endotracheal tube. Uh, in the US, we use the Ballard suction catheter, which is an inline uh, catheter that's always in place. So you can just slide it in and slide it out for suction without disconnecting the endotracheal tube. I don't think there's much evidence in favor of it, but it's widely used in the US. And uh, the prevention of uh, healthcare associated infections in general is critical. One of the important methods by which uh, you want to prevent infection is encouraging the use of breast milk. That also de decreases the risk of infection in uh, babies, including uh, VIP. So those are some tips. So there is a question, how safe is it to give KMC in an intubated baby? I would say it's very safe. But the nurses have to be on board and you have to train them. And you may want to do some simulation using a dummy about how exactly the baby is moved from the radiant warmer or incubator to
to the mother's chest and back. So we do it all the time. So how early a lung and limb physiotherapy to initiate it in cluster care? I'm not sure I understand the question. Are you talking about chest physiotherapy or? Uh, right, so right. chest we don't... physiotherapy and passive limb stretching, what we do for the preterm babies. Yeah, we. I, I would discourage uh, routine chest physiotherapy. I would do it only if needed, if there are a lot of uh, thick secretions that need to be uh, cleared. I would not uh, do that. But yeah, uh, limb physiotherapy, I think if you do it the proper way, it should be good for the baby. KMC, I answered. How frequently closed catheter system is replaced? I think it's replaced every 72 hours, but I need to check that. Yeah, uh, Naina is asking, uh, KMC sensitization in India is quite challenging. So yeah, uh, we have to train the nurses. I don't know if there's any sources. We can have some of the nurses in the US uh, talk to the nurses there if you want in a separate session to explain how they do it. But yeah, in my experience, KMC of a ventilated baby is quite safe and quite beneficial. So I have to, uh, I have to sort of explain. When you ask me things like how frequently a closed catheter system is replaced and so on, I will not know the answers because we have respiratory therapists in the US. So we have doctors, we have nurses, and we have respiratory therapists. So everything related to ventilation, ET tube, suctioning, the ventilator circuit, the respiratory therapists take care of it. And we really kind of uh, don't get into the details of that. So that explains some of my ignorance. When I was at PGI, we used to actually connect the oxygen, do the suction, do the chest PT, intubate, tape the tube. We used to be the respiratory therapists and the doctors. But in the US, uh, become a little spoiled. And uh, the problem, what happening in the US is that in some units, the respiratory therapists are so good that the doctors take a back seat and the respiratory therapists drive all the decision making and how the ventilator is managed. And the doctors just sort of stay in the background. So they end up uh, not becoming experts on ventilation, the doctors. You don't want that either. So one of the things you may want to introduce in your uh, units is if you have nurses who are interested in respiratory care, you can send them for extra training so that they become experts in respiratory, respiratory care, similar to the RTs, the respiratory therapists in the US. I think that would be really interesting to explore as an option. Okay, shall we keep going? Right, sir. So in summary, remember, when cleaning a baby is not looking at the ventilator, look at the holistic care of the baby with respect to nutrition, with respect to developmental supportive care, as well as KMC. So <clears throat> further, the same child, uh, a fellow is asking, so since the baby is on 8-MAP, 40% FAO2, should we consider steroids? not just for extubation, for BPD prevention as well. Should we add vitamin E? I think one of the sir slides answered it. Should we add routinely macrolides to cover atypical bugs? I was going through a BPD protocol of one of the units in Bangalore, where probably on day seven, they routinely give azithromycin to prevent BPD. So I do not know the evidence for it. So let's hear from sir regarding macrolides and steroids for BPD prevention. At this stage, uh, I would not use macrolides. I have to look up the evidence for that. If, if people using that are basing it on good evidence, then I would not oppose it. But uh, right now, we don't use macrolides routinely to cover atypical bugs or uh, or to prevent BPD. Uh, vitamin A definitely, I'm in favor, and we've written some papers on cost effectiveness of vitamin A. But I understand intramuscular vitamin A is not available in the US now, in the in India now. 
then uh, again steroids is a very complex topic and there are uh, three cochrane reviews by henry halliday and colleagues about early use of steroids intermediate use between 7 to 14 days and then late use after 14 days again i would encourage you to develop a unit guideline on the use of postnatal steroids about when to use them how long to use them what course to use and you you follow that guideline consistently that's what i would say and uh, you can look at the cochrane reviews for guidance uh, i can pull up the slide on the evidence for steroids one second let me share my screen If you look at uh, postnatal dexamethasone, uh, there's a relative risk reduction of 22% of CLD in survivors and a relative risk reduction of 27% of a combined outcome. And the absolute risk reduction is 17% or 20%. So definitely it does uh, reduce it, but I would not use it very early. I would wait and generally around somewhere between 14 to 28 days depending on the course of the baby, if the FiO2 is going up, if the baby is unstable, having frequent desaturations, then I would talk to the family and explain to them the risks versus benefits of steroids and, uh, and then uh, make a decision. Again, if you have a unit guideline that, uh, that lays out how to do this, that is very useful. There's one more slide I want to share related to infection. One of my former colleagues, uh, Dr. Bill Edwards, wrote an article about uh, nosocomial sepsis. So we talked about ventilator-associated pneumonia. So ventilated babies are at risk for both ventilator-associated pneumonia as well as uh, bloodstream infections. And when Bill Edwards was uh, starting his work on prevention of infection, he found that there were units that had low infection rates and units that had high infection rates. So they went around visiting these units. He found that one thing was common to all units that had low infection rates. They did not accept that infection was inevitable and that it was an entitlement of premature babies. So when the baby had an infection, they blamed themselves and said, somehow there was a gap in our care. Somehow we dropped the ball. That's why the baby got an infection. In the units that had a high infection rate, the clinicians had the attitude, oh, these are premature babies, their skin is thin, their immunity is low, they have all these lines. So it's natural that they will get infections. So they kind of almost thought it was inevitable and that the baby was entitled to an infection. And Bill Edwards emphasized that the attitude towards prevention of infection is the most important variable for preventing infections in uh, NICU babies. So I would encourage all of you to take the attitude of prevention that you own the infection and you have the blame if the baby has an infection. You meaning the doctors, the nurses, everybody who works in the unit. So you have to take accountability and uh, responsibility. And of course, in the US now, this is easy because there is a lot of attention on infections and even financial penalties if you have high infection rates. The government will impose a fine on you if you have high infection rates. Yes, uh, Supreet is asking online calculators. Yeah, they, they have some use. You can kind of plug in the baby's variables and predict the risk of BPD and the severity of BPD. And based on a cutoff threshold, you can say, okay, in this baby, the benefits of steroids uh, outweigh the risks of steroids. But again, I, these online calculators have been developed from US babies from the neonatal research network. I don't know their applicability to the Indian setting. So I would be a little cautious about it. So if you notice, I'm, I'm 
scrupulously avoiding giving you a recipe and saying you know on day 2 do this with so many milligrams of this i'm emphasizing general principles so that you develop your own uh, guidelines and your own way of practicing that works for your setting next slide so one general comment about guidelines because when we speak with fellows especially during exams uh, or other platforms the fellow says this is the practice in our unit they forget to look at why or the rationale remember guidelines are not decided by uh, your seniors experience or something it should be based on evidence this is somewhat what we see lacking in some of the units where we work nearby sir the guidelines are made by some person's comfort zone rather than having a rationale for it evidence for it or without backing for a data so guidelines need to have all these things taken into account before we actually make it as a routine practice yes uh, critical thinking is very very important by clinicians because you should not practice based on recipe then you're just a uh, like a mindless practitioner who just says oh that person said this so i'm going to do this you have to use critical thinking because that's what evidence based is evidence based medicine is right use of the best clinical evidence clinical judgment and then patient values and preferences when you combine all three you are practicing good uh, evidence based medicine So the answer probably okay. for students is most of us would not use it. We use it primarily using probably online calculators in India, or we use only to facilitate extubation for BPD. Most of us would actually refrain from using steroids per se because of BPD in such babies. We take help of available evidence in the form of online calculators, as Supreet said. So coming back to the case, the baby is now on day seven, is requiring map of seven centimeters. If you do is twenty five percent, the treating team is now ready for extubation. So should we directly extubate, assess for extubation readiness using some methods? I know there are some medications to ensure success of extubation, starting from steroids to caffeine, post extubation care to ensure success. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, the plan for extubation should be discussed. so after you intubate the baby and tape the endotracheal tube okay so i want to make that very clear extubation should be your goal and every day when you round on the baby you should talk about extubation now extubation readiness calculator sanjay chawla and colleagues have published it it's available online they are working on a better uh, uh, more refined model with a larger data set i think you can plug in uh the numbers on your baby and use those but again those data are from the us i don't know if they apply to the indian context but anyway every day when you round you have to assess whether the baby's trajectory is that of worsening is the baby stable or is the baby improving and it it also depends on where the baby is in the course of illness if if the illness is acute and is going to resolve quickly you can start planning for extubation soon but if the baby has uh, cystic lungs is on 60% oxygen has frequent desaturations you have to say okay now we are in for the long haul and this baby is not going to come off the vent tomorrow or the day after because pushing a baby to come off when the baby is not ready that's bad also so there is a lot of clinical judgment involved and if you look at the data on uh, extubation about 15 to 20% of babies get reintubated after extubation and uh, there's a paper by barbara schmidt's uh, group where if you count extubation failure as reintubation within 24 hours the numbers are low but if you extend that time to 72 hours the numbers increase so you have to know what your units uh, reintubation rates are after extubation how often are you successful in predicting 
and you have to decide what is a good extubation failure rate because if your extubation failure rate is 100% sorry if your extubation failure rate is 0% and 100% of your babies are successful when you extubate what does that mean think about it it means that you are keeping the babies on the ventilator for too long so it's like a negative appendectomy rate if your negative appendectomy rate is 0%, that means you're waiting for too long to go in and uh, do an appendectomy. And, uh, or you're, you're going in too early, I mean. And you could be, uh, you know, missing, missing the boat here. So if 100% of your babies are extubated successfully, then uh, you're probably waiting too long. So you have to decide in your unit, what is the acceptable reintubation rate? Is it 10%? Is it 15%? Generally in the literature is about 15%. So use that, use the online calculators, use clinical judgment, also use some common sense. If uh, the baby is tiny and is due for a retinopathy exam tomorrow, don't extubate the baby today because the baby will uh, become unstable from the ROP exam or if the baby is going for a procedure tomorrow, don't extubate the baby today, just wait. Some people are afraid of extubating babies at night. And uh, again, it depends on uh, your unit staffing, how confident you are in uh, uh, the staff in your unit. And if you think that the staff in the unit is not that highly qualified, you may want to wait till next morning. But ideally, every NICU should be a 24-7 operation. And I like to extubate when the baby is ready, not when we are ready. That's a saying that I often repeat. We should extubate when the baby is ready, not when we are ready. Uh, Supreet is asking a very good question about spontaneous breathing trial. Uh, there is a nice article by Walish and colleagues from uh, Montreal. Uh, Dr. Dr. Santana Guillerme is a senior author on that. I encourage you to read that. It's a systematic review. Unfortunately, spontaneous breathing trials in neonates have not been shown to be a good predictor of uh, extubation success. And yeah, medications to ensure success of extubation. Definitely, the baby should be on caffeine beforehand. And if you feel that uh, there is not much of an air leak around the ET tube, you may want to consider maybe three doses of steroids, one before and two after. There are RCTs in favor of that. And I don't use adrenaline naps routinely for such babies. But yeah, the read, the read that paper by Walish and colleagues, and uh, it's a good paper on spontaneous breathing trials. So suffice it to say, there is no magic tool that will predict exactly whether the baby will succeed or not. There are some tools and some guidelines, but clinical judgment is a large, large part of it right now. Uh, I'm not aware of the evidence for n acetylcysteine NEMS. Okay, shall we keep going? Right, sir. So the last slide. So most of our units have 15 beds. Most of us maintain 50% of ventilator beds, including non-invasive ventilation. Most of us have good infrastructure. But do we have systems in place for structured training of nurses? Our nurses are trained in neonatal nursing. Does it include a continued training on respiratory care? So we have bundled approach for most of the infections of late, but should we have for BPD prevention? So how do we prevent unplanned extubations? And what should be the quality indicators? What each unit should monitor, discuss on a monthly basis with respect to ventilation? Uh good questions let me pull up some slides so i want to ask uh, 
Abhishek and the people in the audience. When we say ventilator, what do we mean? What is a ventilator? The ventilator is a device which assists in breathing the newborn. Okay, let me share my screen. If you ask me, the ventilator is the machine, but the ventilator is also the person who is ventilating the baby. Okay, so we spend a lot of time on the machine, but we are not spending time and discussing the person who is driving the machine. It's like saying, oh, we have a lot of uh, accidents on the road. These uh, cars are defective or these cars are not working well. What about the driver? Right? Most of the accidents, it's the driver that is the cause of the accident, not the car. So when, I, when you say ventilator, I want you to think of you, not the machine. That's one important point. And both are important in the causation of prevention of BPD or other complications from uh, ventilation. So physician-induced lung injury is a concept that was introduced by Villar in 2005. And it is preventable lung injury due to lack of knowledge, not following evidence-based practices, omissions, and errors. So ventilation has to be, mechanical ventilation has to be provided as part of a program, not just buying the device because the representative comes and sells it to you and putting it in the unit and plugging it in and connecting the baby. Around that machine, ventilators, the humans, have to be upgraded and qualified and trained so that they use the machine properly. It's just like you can't buy a fancy car, put somebody who doesn't know how to drive and expect them to drive successfully without accidents. So keep that analogy in mind. So we have paid a lot of attention, like even in the chat, people are asking me about HFO, VG, uh, AC, VC. What about the people who are using the ventilator? We need to make sure that they're, they're qualified, knowledgeable, expert, and comfortable in using the devices. So please pay attention to that in your unit. And uh, Gorovitz and McIntyre, who are philosophers, they say, when there, whenever there is failure, there is human fallibility and there are necessary fallibility. Like today, I cannot resuscitate and save a baby who was born at 21 weeks gestation. That's beyond our capacity. Okay, or if there's a baby born with anencephaly, I cannot do a brain transplant in that baby. So that is beyond our capability. But there is unnecessary fallibility, which means there is ignorance and there is ineptitude. So there is knowledge that we know, but we don't apply it correctly. So these things are as important as the machines that we buy. I want you to keep that in mind. So if you apply the concept of ineptitude to respiratory care, uh, we can cause lung damage in many ways just by handbagging. Whenever we take the baby off the ventilator for suction, and handbag, that is a cause of lung injury. And Alan Job said, there is perhaps nothing more dangerous for the preterm lung than an anxious physician with an endotracheal tube and a bag. Some people say I can assess the lung compliance by handbagging, that is called the educated hand, that is a complete myth, and people don't uh, really have the ability to assess lung compliance by manual bagging. So these are all examples of respiratory ineptitude. When you take the baby to the operating room or radiology, sometimes we handbag, or the person who's transporting the anesthesiologist or somebody else may pick the wrong settings. Be careful about that. We already talked about delaying extubation needlessly. Uh, sometimes I've seen wrong weights entered into the ventilators so that the tidal volume per kilo is wrong. And when a baby is transported from one unit to the other or from the delivery unit to the NICU, 
is sometimes uh, in different uh, institutions that is a opportunity for a lot of problems to occur with accidental extubation lung injury and so on i have talked a lot about guidelines and consistency of care so ventilators which is the humans often have different styles based on their training and experience so you may have in one nicu somebody who has done a dm in st john somebody who is trained in the uk somebody who came from the us and somebody who's just had a lot of experience and each person might have a different style so it's important to have a homogeneous style in one unit with the use of guidelines and we've talked a lot about vigilance and monitoring of all these parameters that are listed on the slide uh, as very important for uh, for excellent outcomes so these are some thoughts i have related to the questions so definitely you need to uh, can i see your slide again abhishek yeah so the slides i just showed you is all about having systems in place not just for nurses but for clinicians for trainees when you have post graduate students rotating to the nicu written guidelines for everything preventing unplanned extubation is very very important and quality indicators you have to pick some quality indicators we in the us use unplanned extubation rates we use bpd rates uh we use uh, sometimes air leak rates we track that as well so you have to develop your own quality indicators and monitor them every month to see how well you're delivering respiratory care okay so how are we doing on time are we at the end of our time so we are end of our time but we have many questions so this was the last slide anyways so we had some more questions the chat box uh supreet is asking the role of tps tps meaning like uh, neopuff or a tps ventilator right, yeah i think yeah i think uh, those are good devices and uh, many units still have uh, like uh, self inflating bags or flow inflating bags at the bedside some units have switched to using neopuffs at the bedside which are tps resuscitators i think those are good devices because they limit the pip whereas with the bag it's hard to limit the the uh, the pip and uh, you can cause inadvertent lung injury whereas with the tps resuscitator you can cap the pip but you have to watch the dial sometimes the dial shifts and the uh, end expiratory pressure can become inadvertently high without you realizing it i've seen situations where we've set it at 6 and it slipped and the baby was getting the end expiratory pressure of 10 so you have to be careful about that so i am in uh, i am in favor of that what are the questions do we have most of the audience has been silent uh, do they not have questions or thoughts in any questions from other web platform and uh, platform from youtube uh few questions i have uh, posted on your chat box doctor you may want to refer that naina i can you explain your comment and question about the feynman quote hello hi sir uh, uh, yeah go yeah, ahead go ahead and Uh, so basically i just quoted that ventilator science for us we believe that it uh, surrounds from expert opinion like you so i just tweak that uh, very famous quote by feynman who says that science is organized skepticism in the reliability of experts so we uh, what i mean to ask is is there any particular practice from your experience in the ventilator management from your uh, previous days that we would want to continue to the present era despite having so many advances in the ventilator management (laughs) 
was i don't know sir if it's a difficult question uh no i i'm thinking of the best response best response i think i think i think i think i'm getting an getting echo, an echo. Then you can then you can the... okay is that better now it's better sir right so we cannot avoid ventilation in nicus so in my career over the last 30 years i have seen ventilation go from some being something very glamorous and very high profile oh ventilation it was a very exciting thing that you were going to learn to being recognized as something that is harmful to babies and we should do as little of it as possible so in the mid 90s when we were all going to ventilation workshop it was something very glamorous that we went to learn in order to save babies because those were the days when we didn't have enough ventilators in pgi and we would sit there at night and hand bag babies because that's the only thing we could do otherwise they would die that is still happening in many places in the world but over time i have seen the concept of ventilation being something as a double edged sword that it can be very very dangerous so again that road which i showed you that to me will be the biggest take home point for all of you let me share it again if you remember one thing from my talk just remember this that ventilation is a double edged sword and our job is to keep the baby in the lane so that you support lung expansion and oxygenation and gas exchange but you avoid causing lung injury and causing problems like vap accidental extubations and also brain injury from instability so our job is to keep the baby in the middle and balance these both things the lung injury and the complications they are not easy to see whereas the lung inflation you can monitor the oxygen saturation the blood gases chest x rays and you know if you are not meeting the goals there the lung injury is often invisible so we have to be extra vigilant that is the, the i guess the main take home point in response to nena's uh, uh comment in response to dr nishad Uh, i don't find it useful to do an echo to address readiness for extubation of course the whole concept of pda management completely mired in controversy and uh, you know lot lots to debate there so but i personally don't use echoes to decide about pda but of course if the baby has instability that would change my mind any other questions So Supreet has asked question regarding bronchial alveolar lavage for diagnosis of VAP. Yeah, BAL is uh, commonly used uh, in adults and older children, and sometimes they do micro BALs. But that needs a bronchoscopy, and you have to go in. And the size of the bronchoscope in uh, neonates is uh, it's not favorable, especially in tiny micro trimmings. so diagnosis of vap in neonates is very very challenging and it's often misdiagnosed there are good materials on the cdc website as i said they have changed the terminology to ventilator associated conditions and uh, uh we have to educate ourselves about the new terminology there's one paper where they looked at uh, a gram staining of bronchial alveolar lavage and they found that if the gram stain is positive it's highly predictive of infection deep in the lungs if you want to read about diagnosis of vap the best paper is by michael klompas k l o m p a s i'll put it in the chat here he wrote a paper uh, in the jama many years ago uh, called does this patient have ventilator associated pneumonia it's uh, for patients of all age groups but it really summarizes the evidence for various modalities that we use to diagnose ventilator uh, associated pneumonia including cbc chest x rays 
uh, tracheal aspirates, which are commonly used, bronchoalveolar lavage, mini BAL, lung biopsy, and uh, it's a it's a worthwhile read. Unfortunately, in a lot of units, people just use tracheal aspirates. Most of the time, they pick up colonization of the endotracheal tube, not infection from deep in the lungs, and we overdiagnose VAP because of that. I chatted, I chatted in the name of the author, so for people to look up the article. Okay, anything else? That's it, I think, sir. I think we have answered most of the queries. I think uh, we have been able to address most of their queries and concerns. So any, any last minute questions or queries from any of the delegates or anybody in the other platforms? You can raise your hand in Zoom platform. Where is Dr. Kurana from? So Supreet is, is currently at GMCH 32 with Deepak Chawla sir and Suksham J. She's my colleague sir. She, we did PJ, DM together at PJ Chandigarh sir. Oh, okay, yeah. Supreet, so recently completed our CP video. on close suctioning as well. Oh, okay, okay. So she should have answered most of the questions in my right, place, sir. yeah. Uh, Supreet, convey my regards to Suksham and Deepak. Sure, sir. Uh, so thank you for hosting such a wonderful session. It was very nice interactive session. Thank you. Yeah. So one last question is, when do you use diuretics in your unit for a ventilated baby? Hope that is a question, Nishad, sir. Role of diuretics in a ventilated newborn in your unit. Uh, I am not a big fan of diuretics uh, and there's not much evidence to support its routine use. But if the x-ray looks uh, congested and the baby has gained a lot of weight and there's a respiratory worsening, I might try one or two doses of diuretics. But there are units uh, uh, in the US that religiously swear by diuretics and they dry the babies their blood urea and nitrogen is in the hundreds, creatinine goes up, and they continue to use diuretics. And they have very low BPD rates in the single digits. So there's a wide spectrum of usage of diuretics in the US. Uh, there's a paper by Rachel Greenberg describing the variation in the use of diuretics. And I believe uh, Nick Bamet, no. B-A-M-A-T, also has published papers on this. Uh, but the evidence for diuretics is not highly convincing. So I am I use them sparsely, personally. But that's my personal opinion. Uh, so just can I share some experience about PGA if you want to discuss? Yeah, please. I want to learn. Yeah. So no, it's not about that. Actually, when myself and Abhishek joined... So he was already there. So we remember the time when, as you also remember, that there was only handbagging. So there was this time when in the pediatric emergency, that is the first area where you are posted, that is the new. So there are only handbagging available at that time. Currently, the scenario has evolved. So however, looking back, so basically we could still salvage a lot of newborns with, I mean, great support from the families with minimal VAP, that was one of the best parts because there was no humidification, no VAP. So one thing sir, that frequently sometimes I think about is, is there any role of acetic acid in the VAP prevention? Because previously it was quoted that in the, especially in the CPAP circuits uh, where the, I mean, acetic acid concentration of 0.01% has to be added. But currently there is no such mention in any of the literature. So one thing is that, and secondly, in such units, which are still quite a significant number in, especially in our countries, especially in other LMICs. So shall we try to procure more of TP systems rather than handbagging? What is your take on this? I have not reviewed the evidence on acetic acid for a long time, but uh, I remember we used to put it in the humidifiers 
uh, when I was at PGI. So I don't know the answer to that. We have to look it up. And the other question was about TPs. I think TPs are better than manual bags, uh, either self-inflating or flow-inflating bags. I think they, they're easy to continue manual ventilation with. Uh, the real question is, if the number of babies requiring ventilation is much higher than the number of ventilators you have, how do you support the babies that need ventilation? Uh, so that's a difficult question. I think uh, manual bagging, especially if it's a short time limited uh, event, and the baby can be extubated quickly, Manual bagging is one solution. And I remember in PGI, we used to give it to the family members and they used to sit there and bag all night long. Uh, that was just uh, hard, tough to see. But yeah, I think tea pieces are better than uh, handbags. Is, does that answer your question or uh, was yes. there something else? So, so we can maybe plan something about maybe if you also get to come across the acidic acid because VAP is a real problem which we which is a significant challenge because of a lot of I mean whatever contamination is there pre-existent or during the use of ventilation that occurs in babies. So if that I mean that would be very useful for us. Yeah, everything about how we handle the endotracheal tube, the circuit, the suction fluid, the suction catheters. That has to be completely clean and sterile. So hand hygiene, use of sterile equipment. You can't leave the suction catheter lying on the bed and then put it in the endotracheal tube. You have to use a fresh disposable one each time, but again, that introduces cost. Uh, we have to change the circuits frequently, make sure that the fluids in the humidifier are not contaminated. And if there is a droplets and moisture pooling in the circuit, they have to be emptied so that it doesn't get aspirated into the lungs. All these things are important. So meticulous care will prevent VAP. So then there is also these days the concept of dual uh, heat, heating. Previously, we mostly had single heated uh, these respiratory circuits which are now being, uh, the companies are also vying for that, the double heating is dual heated circuits are much more better. So what is your take on this also? Uh, I, I don't know the data for that. You have to look it up. I don't know the data. Okay, so that's why, because I had conducted, we had this opportunity to, to conduct a thesis on the closed circuits. So we had actually come across all of these challenges. And we had actually not very significantly high incidence, thankfully, during that year. So because we subsequently also, also as you had clearly stated, that we were more cautious while handling. We had made more videos, more practices were changed. So we actually felt that the closed system, in spite of, I mean, a huge investment we had to invest during that thesis, had not been of significantly much benefit, apart from being more meticulous in our practices. Did you publish your paper? I'd like to read it or send it yes, to me. Sir. It is published in European Journal of Pediatrics. So Professor Suksham was the chief uh, supervisor and I was a co-guide. So that is, uh, I think it is freely accessible, I suppose. Right, right, right. Menu bejo to ji. Bilkul, sir, sir, I'll uh, mail you. Okay. Okay, anything else? Okay. Not have any, uh, okay. Chats from any others. So I know learning is a continuous process, and every time when Gautam sir uh, comes up and speaks, we learn a lot from his experience, and uh, we always get inspired from his talks. At least for the next three months, we are fully charged to do better work in India, despite a lot of challenges. So we are always uh, happy to hear from you, sir, in the online platform. So. I think one of the participants, one of the delegates were asking uh, what to do for continuous learning for nurses or doctors. So considering this gap, so we, the team, have come up with an online version of ventilation course. It's both online as well as offline. So we're going to launch probably during the newborn week in November. We are going to launch. So keeping in mind both nurses, respiratory therapists and doctors. So 
you would be happy if gautam sir comes on, comes down for india and uh, in one of our offline workshops we'll be happy to uh, improve our learning for the participants thank you for allowing me to participate today and it was wonderful engaging with everybody and i hope it was useful I appreciate the time with you it's a privilege thank you thank you sir okay bye sumana or vignesh any yes doctor i would uh, like to thank everyone uh, joining in us today for the webinar especially they are uh, speakers taking time out and then giving such a informative uh, topics to the viewers and upcoming uh, like doctor said we have our uh, courses which we are going to launch in the first week of november and then we have a series of uh, continuation of this webinar next week so do register and have So next week we have uh, Dr. Shrinivas Murthy sir from Hyderabad joining us. He is going to take us through formula for success of CPAP in preterms. Today we tried as much as possible not to overlap with CPAP. We tried as much as possible to use to discuss on invasive ventilation. Do join us next Saturday at seven pm for talk on success of CPAP in preterms. So have a happy weekend and happy Dasara festival to all of you. Thank you everybody. Thank you, Doctor. Happy to start to you too.